The students at Melbourne's Birralee Primary School have gone home, but Assistant Principal Tanya Burton still has hours of work ahead. 3.30 is not the end of a teacher's day. The level of admin has increased dramatically. The level of documentation, assessment and data that's needed in each classroom has increased incredibly. The demands are having a big impact on Tanya and teachers across the country. A recent survey of teachers shows they only spend about 40% of their time engaged in face-to-face -face student learning, with the rest consumed with lesson planning, marking, administration and other duties. I think teachers are overwhelmed at times, exhausted. Uh, the to-do list never goes away. If we could remove some of those uh, and allow teachers the time to focus on, the t on teaching and learning, then I think student outcomes would improve. What do we have on at school this morning? Adelaide mum Shelley Code is one parent who's voted with her feet. She's moved her kids to an independent school because of a lack of one-on-one -on -one support at their public school. We were looking at 28 to 30 students to one educator. It felt like there was certainly not enough staff to student ratio and we found that the, um, my eldest was actually falling through the gaps. The link between teacher workloads and student outcomes has been drawn into sharp focus by the Productivity Commission. It's warned that despite an increase in funding, student achievement has stagnated, with between 5 and 9% of students each year failing to meet benchmarks in either literacy or numeracy. We've seen improvements uh, in primary school kids in reading and maths. Uh, what we haven't seen is improvements in primary school amongst kids from poorer backgrounds, kids from the bush, uh, and Indigenous kids, and that's what worries me. The situation we're in at the moment was perfectly foreseeable. Ten years ago, businessman David Gonski headed an inquiry which rang alarm bells about Australia's declining academic performance. Importantly, the report says that differences in educational outcomes must not be the result of differences in wealth, income, power or possessions. To lift standards, he recommended the then Gillard Labor government introduce a funding model in which each school would receive a base rate per student with extra money for disadvantaged kids. This is the right plan to ensure our schools are properly resourced for generations and generations to come. Former New South Wales education boss Ken Boston was a member of the review team. He argues Gonski's original vision has never been fully realised. The reality is governments have not been prepared to take on the strong vested interests representing the non-government sector and in fact reduce the, any rate of increase in the public funding they receive. The public funding is now being allocated to wealthy non-government schools, swimming pools, a wellness centre, a second grandstand, where you've got alongside that public schools struggling to employ to afford to employ the high quality, well, the specialist teachers they need to cater for disadvantaged students. In a statement, the body representing independent schools says those in wealthy areas receive very little public money for each student, and the government is moving to reduce funding for any school it considers is getting too much. Catholic Education says the funding agreement has created greater certainty, but public school teachers argue their pupils are losing out. It is appalling to think we are in a situation right now where some kids aren't getting the education they deserve and that they're entitled to uh, because of the funding model. The national body representing government school teachers says the funding model is not working because states provide the bulk of the money to public schools and they're lagging behind their funding targets. Public school students are missing out on 
on average $1,800 per year per student, we cannot continue to see our system being driven in the inequitable way that it currently is because the results are clear. We're seeing workforce shortages and we're seeing uh, outcomes for our kids uh, that aren't acceptable. If you've got kids from poorer backgrounds, from the bush, from Indigenous uh, backgrounds who are falling behind, then it tells you that we've got more work to do here. What I want to do is work with all the states and territories. You don't get anything by barking orders from Canberra. The Education Union is calling on the Commonwealth to increase its contribution to public schools. Why the federal government believes it should only support a very small portion of the funding that goes to public schools and leave the rest of that up to state and territory governments uh, is unexplainable. The funding agreement is due to expire at the end of next year. You're asking me to preempt the negotiations. I want to talk to the states and territories about how we make sure that we put all schools right across the country on a pathway to full and fair funding. Student performance will continue to decline. There's no doubt about that. The situation can be reversed now. It is not hopeless, but it requires hard political decisions. In Adelaide, Shelley Code says she's noticed the huge difference in sending her three kids to a non-government school. The ratio of staff to students is much better. You're looking at about 10 to 1. We have them excelling in areas where previously they were at, at a deficit. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. When I look at the decision that I've made, I, I actually feel like I come from a point of privilege. Not everyone is as fortunate as that. Back at Birali Primary, Tanya Burton believes unless public schools are appropriately funded, teachers will remain overworked and disadvantaged students won't get the support they need and deserve. Schools have a constant juggle of where do we put the money that we've got. If teachers could just do the teaching and learning, then that would be fantastic. There's only so much that we can do.